begin, there are some community leaders I would like to recognize and thank for their support of Waffles in the Warehouse at Home. Our presenting sponsor, Your Neighborhood Credit Union. Breakfast sponsor, Meal in a Jar. Speaker sponsors, Joseph and Company, Malo Blamey, and Ray Lipsky. Thank you so much for your support and allowing us to have this unique event this morning.
welcome to our seventh annual Waffles in the Warehouse. This year, Waffles in the Warehouse at Home. As with everything else this year, this event looks really different. Normally this morning, you'd be here with us, exploring our 30,000 square foot distribution warehouse, catching up with friends and community members after a busy summer, and learning about the impact of the Food Bank of Waterloo Region and our entire community food assistance network. But as with everything else, we need to adapt. On March the 12th, I arrived at our distribution center for a meeting, an overview of our pandemic business continuity plan and supporting our community food assistance network, a discussion about what happens if. We had been monitoring the World Health Organization since January and saw the rising concern and increase in cases of COVID-19. But I don't think anyone imagined that a state of emergency would be declared in Ontario and across the country just five days later, and it would still be in place today. We left confident in our plan after that meeting, and then it shifted 10 minutes later when it was announced that schools would be closing. That was the beginning of weeks of pivoting, adjusting, and reframing how we deliver service, who we deliver service to, restricting access to this building, keeping our delivery vehicles on the road, and keeping a portion of our staff at home for a contingency plan. So I wanna welcome you all here today to our very first virtual event and our first and hopefully only Waffles in the Warehouse. But today we're gonna to dive a little deeper into our response to COVID-19, but also some fascinating things about the food industry that have not only changed our operation and how we're responding to growing community need, but how it's affecting you at home. to all of our guests who have joined us this morning for Waffles, Waffles in the Warehouse at Home. I'd like to introduce our panel this morning. Uh, Dr. Sylvain Charlebois, who is also known as the Food Professor. He is a professor at Dalhousie University, an expert contributor to the Globe and Mail and La Presse. He is also the lead author of Canada's Food Price Report and writes a blog for Canadian Grocer Magazine. And throughout this pandemic was an amazing resource for us when he popped up on our CTV news feed. So welcome, Sylvain. Thank you for joining us. And John Newfeld is the executive director of the House of Friendship, a multi-service organization in Waterloo Region focused on housing, addictions, treatment, food security, and neighborhood development, and one of our food bank's largest partner agencies. Welcome, John. Good to and be here. And both John and Sylvain have been here in the building at Waffles before, and we'll talk a little bit of later about what we're missing in our Waffles experience this morning. But we're going to jump right into the topic of the day, which is COVID-19. And we all know that, uh, you know, our, all of our lives have dramatically changed. It's changed how we work, how we interact, how we deliver services in our community. But I want our audience to think for a second about their very first peak pandemic grocery store experience. And I want you to think about how you felt walking into that grocery store and what happened as you tried to go about your normal grocery store activities, your grocery store shopping experience. I know for myself, the first time I walked into the store and went to look for chickpeas, I immediately started thinking about food security and about the definition that we use for food security in Waterloo Region, which is about not having uh, a suitable income to be able to purchase food that is suitable for ourselves and our families. But all of a sudden, here I was in the grocery store not being able to make the choices that I would normally make and having to change those decisions about how I was gonna feed my family for the next few weeks. So, I, Sylvan, I wanna start with you and Talk to us a little bit about, from your perspective, how this pandemic has shifted all of our feelings about food security and what the implications from the food system are on the future of food security in terms of changing distribution, supply change. How is it going to affect all of us, but most definitely those vulnerable populations that John and I and our network of programs are serving? Mm. How much time do we have? <laughs> it's uh, it's a big question. Uh, obviously, um, 
And I think uh, you both know uh, that hunger is 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 cruelly invisible. I mean, it's something we don't see, but it's uh, it surrounds us. The empty shells, uh, for the first time, actually, Canadians uh, could see uh, what hunger could feel like. Eventually, I don't think we 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 didn't run out of food, but for for a moment there in March and April, all of a sudden, Canadians really saw what it could mean to be to need a food bank, to be to feel food insecure. And, and that's why there was a lot of panic going on and people buying everything and anything as soon as possible. That 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 sentiment was absolutely real because, uh, I mean, when you think about it, Canada was never has never been a battleground. We never actually experienced war on uh, as, at least in our modern time. And so really, we haven't really experienced food insecurity in a severe matter. Uh, but we do, we saw something we never seen before, and I think that sentiment has f- impacted many Canadians. In fact, at the beginning of September, uh, we released a uh, a survey, the results of a survey looking at donations given to food banks. Yeah. And frankly, Canadians are absolutely sensitive to the issue of food banks, but more so than ever. 17% of Canadians actually has have given to food banks deliberately since the beginning of the pandemic, which is a percentage we've never seen before. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we've seen that here. And we've seen that not just the donations, but the shifting donations as well as things be, weren't available, but then became available. And people were so much more mindful to pick up those things that you know they didn't see in March and April, but then reappeared on the shelves in May and June. And we saw more of that product, absolutely. So, John, from a House of Friendship perspective, what were the pieces from sort of your program operations that that had to change so quickly? How did food delivery in this community change from that frontline perspective? Wendy, before I answer that, I want to just talk about we all know that COVID-19 took a lot of things away from people. But like, seriously, waffles, like, did COVID really have to take the waffles away from us? I mean, that was the thing we always looked forward to in September. And the thing that I appreciate about waffles in the warehouse is that most of us on the call today probably aren't dealing with hunger on a day-to-day basis. Maybe some of us have in the past, but it's not really a reality for us. And one of the things that I appreciated about Waffles in the Warehouse is it, it got a lot of us in the community, community leaders together. And as we walked through that warehouse, we realized that hunger is a huge um, issue, A, in our community. We need to provide food for tens of thousands of people in our community. You know, it's a hunger. Uh, hunger is an issue across the nation. But it's also, um, it's a complex issue that you can't just um, simply address. And one of the things I'm incredibly proud of Um, and thankful that everyone's joined us today, is that in Waterloo Region, you know, we talk about this food assistance network and how we address hunger. I mean, this is something we've been doing for almost four decades, and I'm really proud of um, the food bank's role in in, in how it's done. It's very complex work, and I think when people come into the warehouse, they realize, oh, addressing this issue is a lot of work. You've got to bring a lot of facets together. It's why we're so grateful that Sylvan and his team does this research for us so that we can continue to uh, get better in addressing the needs and and shifting with the demands of the community and hunger in our community. Um, So back to your question, yeah, you know, we were kind of clicking along. We've worked well together for many years and, you know, we're used to serving tens of thousands of people every year with uh, food insecurity. Uh, COVID-19 sure changed things quickly because we couldn't shut our doors. We were an essential service. So how do you keep doing that? And so, um, yeah, so the food hamper program turned, looks started looking like a grocery store with plexiglass everywhere and, you know, people standing in line, which may not seem like a big deal, but we're very sensitive. And one of the things we try not to do in food programs is have people standing in long lines. We serve a lot of people who are refugees and people who come from war-torn countries and it that triggers things for people it's just it's a it's again it's another line you're standing and will there be food by the time you get to the front of the line or will there be not 
So we try to have a welcoming environment where people can kind of sit, socialize while they're waiting for food. And we couldn't do that during COVID, right? And so that was one of the challenges. Um, we also, in partnership with the food bank, bring food right down to a neighborhood level in people's own communities where they could be together with their neighbors uh, addressing uh, their food needs. And community centers were closed during COVID. And uh, so we set up shop in parking lots at a community center, set up a bunch of tents. Uh, food bank truck would come, unload a bunch of skids, uh, prepackaged boxes. And we did what we had to to address the needs of the community. Uh, and then lastly, um, think about people living in supportive housing with lots of health issues, uh, aging, uh, mental health, addiction challenges, um, and trying to get food for them. And, and the food bank stepped up and all of a sudden the food bank truck came every day for our supportive housing residents with prepacked meals. And it was an absolute gift to them. And one of the things that they absolutely loved and were grateful for COVID because they probably ate better and really appreciated uh, the kindness of the food bank providing this food for them. Mm -hmm. We heard some really great stories and, and you had, you were so kind to share some of those stories with our team along the way, which really kind of gave us a boost when things were getting a little tiring and really, really tough. So we're so appreciative of that feedback. I'm glad you mentioned lines because one of the um, one of the things in our community food assistance network many, many years ago was we talked as a network about service delivery and dignity of client service and lines was one of the things that we worked really hard as a network to eliminate. Um, but the other thing that we talked a lot about when we really sort of ramped up the work that we're doing as an entire network was about choice. And we wanted to make sure that um, families and individuals who are accessing our programs and services had that choice, um, whether it be, you know, cultural needs or dietary needs because of health issues. We wanted to make sure that our programs had choice. And now all of a sudden in during the pandemic, we were able to continue delivering the service, but the choice all of a sudden started to disappear because we couldn't offer plexiglass and lines. We had other programs who couldn't have their, um, we had programs that have like a marketplace grocery shopping model, that couldn't happen anymore. But we also didn't have a choice as the distributor as the food. And so we started to navigate some of the changes, um, not only with how service was being delivered in the community, but how we were going to be able to procure the food. And thank goodness for the food professor. We were glued, Sylvan, to your Twitter um, as you started talking about supply chains and, and supplies of food. And I'm wondering if you could share with us sort of you know, from a food distribution perspective, what are, are things that are now becoming trends in the food industry um, around food distribution and what are we going to see and what are we going to not see in the weeks and months to come? Oh, yes. Also uh, a big question, I know. I know, yeah, it is. Uh, I, I would say uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, I felt more like a therapist than an academic because a lot of people wanted to be reassured. Uh, I actually had producers calling me asking me if I was telling the truth uh, on air about uh, about food security and and supplies we have access to. Uh, a lot of people actually learn a great deal about supply chains. Uh, frankly, because we've taken supply chains for granted, food banks absolutely understand supply chains. You have to, to be good at what you do because you have to understand who the partners are and who's dealing with whom but but consumers don't necessarily understand and frankly they've never they were never given an opportunity to to appreciate the complexities of supply chain and that's kind of that's what happened at the beginning of the pandemic i would say really the big big shift happened when food service closed uh and that's when we saw uh, stories related to farm gate waste, uh, the milk dumping, uh, uh, some uh, potatoes being lost, mushrooms, uh, even animals, perfectly healthy animals being euthanized, uh, euthanized. I mean, those are really sad stories. And it all happened because of this one gigantic sector closing down. And that's why I was very happy to see the federal government stepping in and, and set up uh, some, some programs to help the industry 
um, manage some of these surpluses, uh, whether it's for this pandemic or or future occurrences. So I think we're better equipped looking at surpluses. And of course, in processing and distribution, it was hectic. I mean, I can tell you probably for two weeks in, I would say, beginning to mid-April, a lot of people in the food industry that I've talked to were pretty nervous. I mean, they were not sure what was going on with the border. We weren't sure exactly what was going on with global supply chains uh, because we do import a lot of foods. And so a lot of things could have happened, but pay people hung tight. They recognize that we have an open system and uh, things went well in the end. But I can tell you, I mean, still looking at what's going on today, uh, we, we're, we're, we're just trying to make sure that if, if there is a second wave or, or another sort of uh, event like the pandemic, that we're ready and we're able to deliver without impacting food prices, because that's the big issue right now. And you know that, Wendy, John, you, you guys know this, food prices are going up as a result of what's been happening the last six months. And that's and that's a, one of the things that we've been looking at and we're still trying to navigate, you know, some of the data and stats that we were seeing in terms of the number of people that were coming to um, to access support during the early days. And, and interestingly enough, throughout Waterloo Region, the numbers of people who were accessing service in probably the first 12 or 16 weeks of the pandemic was pretty much the same as the previous year. I know John's team was a lot busier. Some of our other partners were a lot busier, but it's because a lot of our smaller programs closed. And that was part of our plan. We actually had planned in the event of a pandemic for smaller partners to close, the larger partners to step up to deliver the service. And it worked really well because we were a big part of helping to flatten the curve to make sure that everybody was staying home and staying safe. But now that you know, you're talking about, you know, food prices are going up, we're starting to see shifts and changes in government supports. We we firmly believe that some of the supports that the federal government provided over uh, the spring and summer months helped keep people away from the doors of our food programs. John, is your team looking at, I know we are from a food planning perspective, but are you guys looking at what the potential increase is going to be in people accessing our supports and services in the months to come as those government um, programs sort of dwindle, change, shift, and as food prices go up, especially leading into the winter? For sure. We have some obvious concerns that uh, I think what's held things at bay uh, is all the intervention and the support. Um, but, you know, what happens is some of these uh, support programs end, or maybe they'll morph, we're hoping that they'll morph into maybe other kinds of support um, to help carry us through. The, the challenge with this pandemic is it's it's like it's like a bit of a black swan event, right? Like you can't you couldn't fully prepare for it, and you can't fully um, prepare for what maybe the outcome of it is. Um, and so I don't know if it's fair to compare. You know, the last time we had a major crisis, I, I would say um, it was kind of the recession of the late two thousands, and we saw food um, people coming to the food hamper program spiked by about 30 percent uh, very quickly. Um, and so that was really tough for us because we, you know, we, we weren't able to respond um, probably as well as we could have. And so I think this is the strength of the Food Assistance Network, Wendy. I think is if we work together, um, we have confidence in the food bank that, you know what, if all of a sudden there is a spike, I feel like this community, we will be prepared for that. It's when you work in isolation or completely on your own that I, I think you can let fear set in uh, and and really get kind of immobilized by that. And so I think right now we're focusing on doing the best we can to respond now, try to do some uh, planning for the future. But I know we're not in this uh, on our own. Uh, yeah, and that's been a big piece of it throughout this whole thing. And, and also for us working, and you were on a couple of the groups uh, working with the regional pandemic plan too, for us being connected to the municipality, and we normally don't work that closely with government, um, but in the state of emergency, being able to work with the municipality, um, and, and I have to brag a little about Waterloo Region. So sorry to people from outside of Waterloo Region who might be on this call, but in the early days of the pandemic, we were on a call with some, some of our food bank partners across the country. And 
some of them were shocked that we were working so closely with our network and working so closely with our municipality. But for us, it was that collaborative approach to making sure that we could keep things moving. And it was tough. It was challenging, but we were able to, to keep things moving. And now we've got mm. a pretty, I think, a pretty amazing um, food procurement plan that's already taken us sort of six months out. If that 30% does become a reality, that's what we're planning for and we're prepared for it, which is which is pretty mm -hmm. awesome. So thanks for that. Yeah. So there, there, there is this public recognition of uh, the economic role of, of food banks. I mean, the the difference between uh, between this pandemic and the late 2000s recession is that uh, obviously governments uh, had to come in with very generous programs to help help people uh, who've just lost their job. We had millions of people losing their jobs all at once. It, never, it has never happened before. And food banks are wonderful because they are very responsive, very targeted and strategic, but it was overwhelming. That's why governments have to step in. The problem with all of these programs is that you can't afford to do it twice. <laughs> you saw we're looking at huge deficits and and huge debts that governments governments around the world will be highly fragmented and, and highly in debt coming out of the pandemic. And that's why you need uh, some very efficient safety nets like food banks. Y you have to set the you have to set yourself up in, or, in order to respond to these uh, market failures. Yeah, absolutely. What and what do you think sort of longer term and, and you talked a little bit before about sort of things that were changing in agriculture and, and all of the things we learned about the industry. I know from from my standpoint locally, it was quite fascinating how many times we got a call as the food bank who said, we're hearing these stories about agriculture, we're hearing these stories about milk, can you fix that? So all mm. of a sudden the food bank became the go-to for fixing all of the food problems. Yeah, so no, absolutely. I, so I flipped the conversation to use it as an education um, about the system. But I'm wondering sort of bigger than that. I know that we can't fix a lot of thing lo things locally, but do you think this is going to change a conversation um, across the country about our food system and our about our ability to to be able to control things a little more locally, to access more food locally, um, so that we aren't relying on these bigger, broader systems. Do you think that's going to change as a result of all of this? It, it has changed already. I mean, you can see uh, our lab, uh, we're currently working with uh, with several provinces right now, including Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, on, on food security uh, programs, growing your own. We actually are working with some provinces on uh, on gardening programs uh, more than ever people are growing their own they're cooking a lot more of course they're growing their own food so there's there's this need to uh, re-engage with food systems and, and kind of control uh, the need to control your your procurement strategy as a household I guess is, is clearly there will it last? Nobody really knows. Uh, it, it will. It will really depend how long this pandemic will last, and and whether or not uh, the, the the phenomena. Uh, I mean, this is historical. I actually do believe that we are in the midst of seeing a COVID generation. Uh, I actually believe that uh, that in order to create a generation, you need a profound event, and this is one of them. And and the COVID generation. So who I would include in that group, it would be probably pretty much uh, most people under the age of 30 who saw their careers completely being disrupted overnight. And uh, they're going to be affected by what's happening or what has happened this year. Uh, and what I mean by that, well, it's going to be about understanding food system. It's going to be about even uh, I wrote a, a piece lately uh, in terms of the COVID generation looking at a nationalized food distribution network. Imagine that, because there's, there's been a lot of talks around, around how we make sure that grocers do sell locally grown products and processing actually survives in Canada. And, and one of the ways to do that is to actually uh, allow for rules to change because right now there's there's a lot of tension within the supply chain so there's there are 
public discourse around food distribution and policy, I think, will change over time, uh, especially for people under the age of 30. So, John, I'm going to ask you the same question, but I'm going to ask it about our food assistance network. So I think a lot of people, um, hopefully a lot of people on the call have seen some of um, the, the innovations that have happened through all of this. We've seen the stories of, of what the food bank do working with a community partner to distribute meals. We've seen the work that you did moving the shelter uh, into um, a hotel setting. What do you think the long term impacts of COVID are going to be on our network as a whole and how we deliver food services, but also our shelter, residential and supportive housing services in Waterloo Region? A couple of things I'd say. One, I think we're starting to realize that um, COVID's reminded us if we work together as a strong network, that we it's not about a certain program or an agency or whatever, that we can actually address the issues in our community so much more effectively. So we need to keep that as the focus. Um, you know, anyone living in Waterloo Region, it really doesn't matter whether they're living in, um, you know, downtown Cambridge or they're living in a rural area somewhere in Wellesley or downtown Kitchener. If they're struggling with hunger, um, it they don't care about who provides it. You know, as long as it's kind of it's provided there that they could address, you know, their hunger or the hunger of their children. Um, so I think. You know, we've seen the power of what happens when we work really effectively together. The other piece, I, I don't know how many folks in our community um, even realize the breadth and depth of the food bank that we have. I think, again, prior to coming to House of Friendship, I would have assumed the food bank is for individuals and families struggling with hunger. They go to some building, pick up some food, and that's it. I don't know if people realize that the food bank of Waterloo um, powers, you know, um, food in the shelters in our community, food in, um, you know, women's shelter. Um, if, if people realize how many meals um, the food bank helps provide in our community every day. I mean, uh, you know, there's a hot meal, there's a hot lunch every day, there's a hot lunch, uh, supper in our community every day. That food comes from the food bank. And um, I think people don't realize when, you know, they donate to, to the food bank or pitch in one way or another, um, the breadth of actually what it all, who it all serves and, and the level of people um, that it serves from people who are homeless, people who are living in supportive housing to those who are very precariously um, employed. So like, I think we should all, all of us on this call, you know, are supportive of the food bank and we should be proud of that, that it's way bigger than any of us uh, kind of assume. So I hope we continue to look at um, innovative ways that we can provide, um, let's say, food to people who are precariously employed or people who are precariously housed um, that, you know, maybe the difference between them affording their rent that month and getting evicted is that they don't they can save a little bit on their grocery bill because they can get access to a food program somewhere and that. Um, and so I hope we continue uh, trying different things. You know, I again, we couldn't have done the shelter in the hotel if it wasn't for the food bank helping out with some food being brought there. You know, our supportive housing residents, you know, those meals coming to their door in a time where they didn't understand why they couldn't go out of their apartment, why they couldn't talk to their neighbors. You know, the folks living in our supportive housing are already isolated, struggling with mental health, struggling with a bunch of things. And so for a meal to show up on their door um, mm -hmm. was a lot more than just a meal. And, you know, Wendy, I sent you that email that, um, a few months ago and I told you that you and your team are nauseating to me because uh, I, I kept coming. In, I'd have to go in the office periodically to pick some stuff up and I'd walk past our supportive housing residents. And not once did they say, oh, John, thank you so much for, you know, what House of Friendship's doing for us. All they kept talking about was the food bank and all these meals. Oh, look, John, the food bank truck is here again looking after us. This food is amazing. And so it was just nauseating to keep hearing how wonderful the food bank uh, was serving our residents. That's great. No, Thanks. John is absolutely, it's it's great to, to hear these stories. I, I've always believed that food banks are, are a miracle of the human spirit. It, it gets it gets humans together to help other fellow humans. And and you're right, John, it's not just a meal. It's, it's, it's a signal telling someone that, uh, 
that uh, someone is thinking about them. Something, someone, something is taking care of them in a moment of need. So it's, it's just wonderful to see. Well, thank you both for that because it both of you in in different ways were such a huge part of us being able to keep moving and to be to be educated to have knowledge to feel like we were on top of things that were going on in the industry to hear the feedback from from uh, the clients and the staff and and all the community partners really you know when things got really really tough we we just latched on to those things and those silver linings that really kept us moving forward and we are so proud of of the work that our team did and our volunteers did but we're also really proud to be part of this community and exactly what you both just said knowing that there is a community here who is willing to support who wants to help who is donating at you know a much higher level to really help us um, continue to keep that food moving and keep everything on the road and, and keep people healthy while we're all trying to figure out what's next i'm not even going to get to the question about what's next because i know we're still all just trying to navigate what has just happened over the last few months um, but I want to, again, thank you guys for joining us. There's probably lots more to talk about. And so we have this unique opportunity now um, to move into some breakout sessions. Um, so um, we're going to move into two different breakout sessions. So breakout number one. Uh, we'll be with Sylvain and Kate McDuff, who is our uh, Network Planning and Programs Manager uh, for the Food Bank of Waterloo Region and the Community Food Assistance Network. And Kate's been working really closely uh, with our network partners throughout this whole pandemic on who's open, who's closed, what are the needs are, what are the needs shifting and changing, um, and actually sharing with those partners what's going on in the food industry. So I thought it'd be a great opportunity for our guests to um, ask some questions to both of you. And then John and I are gonna be in breakout number two and talk a little bit more about any questions that people might have about, you know, specifically about some of the things that happened during uh, the early days of this pandemic that impacted our community, but also um, the essential community services that are being offered in this community all year round. So in each of these sessions, if you have questions, please be sure to type them in the chat and the moderator will share with the presenters and we'll we'll keep the conversation going uh, in the breakout rooms in a few minutes. So thank you again.